Welcome to Woman on Her Path. Every woman has her own unique path. But what does that mean? How does said woman know what her path is? How does she find the courage to follow her path? I am your host, Tiffany Cooper. I am a mother, energy worker, community herbalist, and bhakti yogi. By sharing my experiences and insights on my path, I hope to inspire and encourage you on yours. When we follow our path, we find the answers we need in life. Let's find answers together and create a better world for ourselves and those around us. Hello, lovely women on your paths. I hope you had a productive week since we were last together. And by productive, I mean that you were able to accomplish whatever it was that was important to you. And that could have been anything from getting the rest that you needed to finishing a project that you have been working on. Productive in getting closer to whatever it is that you need. So today we're talking about a topic that I feel is of the utmost importance for women. I chose today's topic because it is one of the most prevalent topics that comes up with my female clients. That topic is sovereignty. It is a woman's prerogative to make choices and set boundaries in her life. And very often, I talk to women who are struggling with choices and boundaries. Actually, I think it's something that we have all struggled with at some point. We live in societies that expect us to be martyrs, to put our own needs and desires aside to take care of everyone else, as if our only use as women is to nurture others. We are expected to always say yes to everything that is requested of us. When we say no, we are treated as though we have done something wrong. Whether it's a questioning or even a dirty look or repetition of the request to give us another chance to reply the desired way. It can even be a challenging repetition of our no reply to get us to back down or simply staring us in the face with a frown to show disapproval. Yes, we have seen it all. (laughs) No one ever accepts our declining to do what is asked naturally. It is unnatural to people for women to say no. No one bothers to think or even ask if they have requested something beyond our limitations. And God forbid anyone would be caring enough to consider how we feel. Now granted, there are times and stages of life when we must put others' needs before ours. For instance, when we are raising children or taking care of elderly parents or simply even making compromises in relationships with people that we care about. Those times and stages are temporary and cannot be done well unless we have the energy to give in the first place. Done well, done well. We cannot give from an empty well. We have to replenish ourselves after we give of ourselves so that we don't end up empty and depleted. Depletion can be a difficult place to come back from. Depletion changes our entire outlook on life. Depletion leads to depression 
an even deeper hole to dig out of. It is a woman's prerogative to make choices and set boundaries. A woman must have the ability to make healthy choices for herself. Included in that ability is the ability to set healthy boundaries within and around herself. We must know the difference between what will be best for the most involved, including ourselves, and what will not. When we make healthy decisions, we must stand firm in our decision and not let others pressure us into the decision they want us to make. Woman, how many times have you decided to do something, then reconsidered it because you worried about what others would think? How many times have you reconsidered a decision because you didn't want to do something that you think may possibly make others not like you, or you think that what you decide is too much, which in your mind translates to, you are too much? In bhakti, the criteria for making decisions that we try to use is to think what would be favorable for our spiritual lives and what would be unfavorable for our spiritual lives. I have always tried to live by that creed as well. Only before coming to bhakti, it was what is favorable toward my purpose in life and what is not favorable. We need a solid basis for our decision-making. It is helpful to have an idea of who we are or who we think we are and what our goals in life are. Of course, these are living concepts. They do not always stay the same, but they provide a foundation with which to build our lives on. When we are living in the energy of our genuine selves, it becomes much easier to make decisions. For example, if I feel deeply in my heart that my calling in life is to help people who are unhoused by providing hot meals for them, then I will make decisions about other parts of my life that will free up time to prepare meals and arrange distribution of them. I may take a job that does not require me to work weekends so that I can dedicate my time to my calling. I may move to an area where I can be closer to those who are unhoused to make it easier to offer them food. Perhaps I will even just find a group that is already feeding unhoused people and join it. And of course, making big decisions in our lives, like where to work or where to live, etc., all require the ability to trust ourselves. And I've talked about this before, that we live in societies that do not trust women, which subconsciously leads us not to trust other women or ourselves. Almost every decision we make brings up self-doubt. In addition, people close to us, and sometimes people we don't even know, feel they have a license to express their doubts about our decisions. I was recently with a group of women, and one of them mentioned that years ago, she and her husband decided not to have children. <laughs> so now you know where this is going. She said that ever since she and her husband made that decision, everyone around her still tries to make her feel like they made a mistake. They say things like, you are missing out, or you are going to reg regret this someday. And my response to her was, of course they say that because women are not allowed to make our own choices. We are supposed to follow the choices that society has already made for us. 
even if it were true that this woman would one day realize that she was missing out on something, that's okay. There are consequences for everything we do in life. And even when we make a decision that we think is best at the time, the result can turn out to be unfortunate. We cannot control everything in the world. And usually, when people unsolicitedly advise us that we are making a mistake, they are projecting their feelings about their own abilities and experiences. So if you make a choice that is different from their own choices, then they begin to question themselves. An example, say you go to a party and you decide not to drink alcohol, then others will become uncomfortable. They want you to do what they are doing. They may worry that they have made a poor decision for themselves by drinking, or they may even be jealous that you are strong enough to go against the grain and they weren't. They become suspicious that you are judging them when really they are judging themselves. <laughs> also reminds me of another conversation that I just had with a woman. She was telling me how unnatural it felt to put her newborn baby in a separate room at night while she and her husband slept comfortably together. And, of course, her pediatrician told her to do so, along with the admonition that if the baby woke up at night, to let him cry it out until he went back to sleep. This is such common advice, originally proposed by a male doctor, by the way, that when women give birth and are caring for their newborn babies, this advice is hardly ever questioned. Often, when a new mother does question it, she quickly tells herself that rather than listening to her own intuition, that often tells her that a newly born human being whose only experiences thus far have been within the womb of its mother, listening to the sound of her voice, hearing her heartbeat while completely bathed in her energy, would feel insecure and probably even afraid being put in a crib in the dark of night while its mother and possibly the only other human being it knows are snuggled together in a separate room. So this new mother overrides herself to follow the advice of someone who has no responsibility, no love for, and often no vested interest in raising her child. It also assumes that a baby will never learn to fall asleep on its own. It makes absolutely no sense that a human being cannot naturally perform a basic human function. Of course, there are certain disorders that prevent someone from doing basic things in life, but it is exactly that, a disorder which does not exist for all human beings. Whether a mother decides to let her baby cry it out or not is her decision to make based on her own capabilities. And full disclosure here, I just want to add that I am the mother of three grown children, and we never owned a crib, and it was never a problem for us. Now, the other thing that I think is laughable about the woman who I mentioned, who she and her husband decided not to have children, is that if she had decided that she wanted to have children, no one would have questioned her. Having children is what society expects of her and the rest of us as women, whether we or our husbands want us to or not. 
I wish I had asked her how many people told her husband that he was making a mistake. Besides a man's mother, how many people would uninvitedly tell him that? If women do not abide by societal rules, we are deemed difficult, demanding, haughty, weird, selfish, or even irresponsible. There is so much pressure to do what we are told that some women don't even know what they want. Sometimes when women are given a choice, they don't know what to do because they have never been taught the skills to make choices for themselves. They have not been taught to think about who they are or even who they want to be. They have not been encouraged to develop their own goals in life. They have not been trained to think for themselves. Instead, women are conditioned to please others at the cost of completely neglecting themselves. We have to learn to set boundaries, to decide where to draw the line. Now, of course, with that, we need to start internally. How far are we willing to go to get certain things done in life? Am I willing to sacrifice particular things in order to achieve my goals? How much am I willing to put up with? Once we've decided those things, we exude that energy outwardly, which usually signals to others who will recognize our boundaries. The boundaries we set for ourselves comes out in the language we use, which also lets people know where to stop. However, we all know at least one person who is a boundary crosser the one who will ignore our boundaries and do whatever they want, or the one who will push or beg or threaten us to get us to do what they want us to do. <laughs> in fact, I have dealt with so many of them in life that they have become so transparent that sometimes I am amazed that they don't see their own behavior. You know what I'm talking about. The ones who are so wrapped up in their own desires that they bombard you with them while completely ignoring anything that you have to say. And if you do manage to somehow voice your own desires or opinions, then they pull out typical bullying tactics and try to manipulate you by treating you like you are a demon and they are your victim. They are the ones you need external boundaries for. Depending on how aggressive they are, we have many, many choices. We can simply tell them that we are not going to do things their way and leave it at that without argument or discussion. If they still won't leave us alone, we can just not communicate with them at all, leaving them without any boundaries to cross. And then there is my favorite which is to block them energetically. We can create energetic bubbles or blocks which they cannot penetrate. All human beings need love and attention to thrive. But unfortunately, not all human beings are given the amount of love and attention that they need. If they do not learn the proper means for getting that love and attention, they try to take it or get it in any way that they can. That is a sad thing. However, it is not a thing that we necessarily have to be party to. It is something that a good therapist or real spiritual advisor can help with. So don't feel guilty if you do not have the patience 
the fortitude, or the qualifications to deal with someone else's issues. We are not all born with those attributes, and it takes a long time to learn them. One of my favorite books of all time is called If Women Rose Rooted. It is by Sharon Blackie. I love this book for many reasons, but the reason that speaks loudest to me is that in it she discusses the deep feeling of being connected to the land upon which you live. In Welsh, there is actually a very special word, and... Although I did ask a Welsh friend to help me with pronunciation, and he did, um, please forgive me, native Welsh speakers, if I botch it up. So the word is hiraith. I wrote a poem about hiraith many years ago. There is no equivalent to hiraith in English or any other language for that matter but it means to feel a longing for home. It is a deep longing that is tinged with deep sadness. It is a feeling of loss, the loss of something irretrievable, of a place or a time and close family and friends that cannot ever happen again. I have even read that for the Welsh, this feeling is reciprocated by the land. Wales misses her people just as much as they miss her when they are gone. Now, in the book, Blackie basically writes that we all need to feel a connection to our respective ancestral homes in order to reclaim our sense of belonging. I agree with that in part only because I have found myself in the midst of Hireth in places I have visited but never lived. And as I sit here in the country where I was born and raised, the feeling of not belonging here constantly stalks me. It always has, and it always will, as long as I am here. I have been to places where the land embraces me and tells me precious secrets, where the people touch me at the level of my soul just by the look in their eyes and the sound of their voices. I live in a vast, beautiful country, but I will always be a visitor. Another thing that I like about If Women Rose Rooted is in the book, Sharon Blackie shares my favorite rendering of the story called The Riddle from King Arthur and the Knights of the Round Table. Her version of the story is the most loving and empowering version I have ever heard. It speaks directly to the experience of being a woman. It speaks to our true needs. And now here is the story. One day... King Arthur was hunting in the forest with his men when a deer briefly stepped into view and then just as suddenly vanished into a tangle of trees. Stay here, everyone, said Arthur. I'll stalk this one myself. 
with his bow in one hand and his arrows slung over his shoulder, the king crept after the deer until, deep into the forest, he slew it, finally, with a single shot. But as the animal fell, a tall figure, all dressed in black, well-armed and strong, stepped from the shadows and stood in front of Arthur. How fortunate for me that we meet this way, with your arrow already released from your hand, a deep voice boomed. Arthur, once you did me a great wrong by giving my lands to your nephew, Guan. Now I will repay you with death. Thinking quickly, Arthur said, to slay me here, armed as you are, and I clothed only in my hunting greens, would bring you no honor. Shame will forever follow you. I'll grant you anything, name it, land or gold, to spare my life. The Black Knight nodded slowly. There is no land or gold that I desire, he said, and so I'll give you the chance to solve a riddle. One year and a day from now, you must come to me here in the woods, without friends and without weapons. If at that time you're unable to solve this riddle, no man will object if I take your life. But if you answer the riddle correctly, you may go free. I agree, said Arthur hastily. And what is this riddle? You must tell me what it is that women desire most above all else. Arthur frowned, but then nodded and gave his word of honor that he would return as asked a year and a day later. And so the Black Knight slipped back into the trees and was gone. Arthur blew his bugle, and his hunting companions soon found him with the slain deer at his feet. They returned at once to Camelot. But Arthur shared what had taken place only with his friend and nephew, Guan. Sir, don't worry, said the young knight after he heard the story. Let's ready both your horse and mine. I will go in one direction and you the other. And so we will ride into every town in the country. Wherever we go, we will ask each of the women we meet for the answer to this riddle, and we will go on until we find the response which seems to be correct. And so the king and Guan rode away. Everywhere they went, they asked what it was that women desired above all else. All the women who answered were certain that their answer was the only true response, and yet each answer was different. Some said that women loved to be well-clothed. Others said they wanted never to be scorned. Some said women wanted a husband who was handsome and strong. Others that they wanted a man who would never try to prove them wrong. And so Arthur and Guan collected many an answer, yet neither of them found one that rang true. Soon, only a month remained, and they each turned back to Camelot downhearted. As he rode through the forests not far from the castle, Arthur met a woman. Though she was clothed in gold and wore precious stones, she was as foul a creature as ever a man saw. Her face was red and covered with snot, her mouth huge and all her teeth yellow hanging over her lips. Her eyes were bleary and protruded, each larger than a ball, and her cheeks were as broad as a woman's hips. She had a hump on her back, her neck was long and thick, and her hair was clotted into a heap. 
She was built like a barrel, with shoulders a yard wide and enormous hanging breasts. The lady stepped up alongside Arthur as he stared. God speed, King Arthur, she said. You may speak with me or ride on, but either way, your life is in my hands. What do you mean, lady? asked the king. What business have you with me? I know of your quest, she said. And of all the answers you have been told, I know that none of them will help you. Only I know the correct answer. Grant me just one thing, and I'll tell it to you, or else you'll lose your head. What is it that you want, said Arthur? If I can, I shall grant it. You must grant me a certain knight to wed. His name is Guan. Either I marry him, or you will meet your death here in the forest in a month's time. Alas, Arthur thought to himself, what a terrible thing, that I should be the cause of Guan marrying such a creature. He said aloud, I cannot promise that Guan will marry you. He alone can decide. But in order to save my life, I will do what I can. And so for now, we must part, lady. But tell me before I go, what is your name? I am Lady Ragnall, said the loathsome hag. Arthur returned to Camelot, where the first man he met was his nephew. Arthur told Guan everything except the request of the loathly lady to wed him, saying simply that the Lady Ragnall would only share her secret in return for the promise of a husband. Is that all? said Guan. I'll wed her, and would even if she were a fiend. Otherwise, I would not be your friend and kinsman. You are my king and have honored me in many a battle. I will not hesitate. And so, a few days later, Arthur rode out of town and returned to the spot where he had met the Lady Ragnall. He told her that Gawain had agreed to marry her. So tell me now, and quickly, my lady, the answer to the riddle. Sir, you will now know, without further digression, what women want most, Lady Ragnall responded. It is a simple enough answer. The one thing that we desire above all else is to have sovereignty. So go on your way and tell this to the Black Knight who will for certain be angry and curse the one who taught it to you, for all his labor is lost. I assure you that your life is now safe and ask you to remember your promise. Arthur rode on as fast as he could, alone and unarmed, to the place where he had met the Black Knight a year and a day before. There he found him waiting. The king began by offering an answer that he had been given by one of the women he'd encountered around the country. And then another. And another. And yet another. After each answer, the knight shook his head with glee. No, no, he said. Obviously, you have no idea. You are as good as dead. Prepare to bleed. Wait a minute, Arthur said. I have one answer left to offer you. Very well, then, said the Black Knight. But know this, after that answer, there'll be nothing left to you but your death. Here is the answer, said Arthur, and there will be no death. For above all, women desire sovereignty.
And who was it that told you this, roared the Black Knight? No doubt it was my sister, the Lady Ragnall. May she burn alive on the hottest of fires. Yet now I am compelled to release you. So go before I change my mind and break my word. Arthur quickly turned around his horse and sped back to the Lady Ragnall to bring her back to Camelot for the wedding. So unpleasant was the prospect of holding a public wedding with such a bride that he told her the ceremony would be an early morning affair, knowing this meant that there would be few or none to attend. But Lady Ragnall would not agree to this. No, she said firmly, I must be wed openly with a full wedding feast and plenty of guests in attendance. When finally they met, Lady Ragnall carefully watched Guan, her future husband. Was he disgusted by her? Would he turn his back on her and ignore her? Strangely, he did none of these things. Guan behaved as if he cherished his loathsome bride. And so they were married with great ceremony and in a hall filled with guests. The queen and her ladies wept for Guan, and the king and his knights mourned, for the lady Ragnall was so ugly. She had two long teeth on each side like boar tusks. One grew upwards, the other down. Her wide, foul mouth was covered with gray hairs, and her lips lay lumped on her chin. But all the while... Guan treated her with great affection, courtesy, and respect. After the wedding came, the wedding feast. Lady Ragnall sat at the head of the high table, and everyone gasped at her bad manners. When served, she ate as much as six people might. She used her nails, which were three inches long, to break up her food. She ate and ate. Nothing came before her that she didn't eat. And so she ate until the meal was done. Later that night, as they arrived in their bedchamber, the Lady Ragnall turned to her husband and said, Sir Guan, now that we are married, show me your love with a kiss. If I were fair, you would not delay. But even though I am not, I pray you do this at my request and with all due speed. Guan said courteously, Indeed, my lady, I will at once, that and more. But as he turned to kiss his bride, standing there before him was not the appalling creature he had married, but the fairest woman he had ever seen. Oh, he cried out, what are you, a witch? I am your wife, she said. That is all. Ah, lady, then I must not be in my right mind, said Guan. Earlier today, you were the foulest sight that I ever saw. Pardon me for saying so. And now I cannot believe my good fortune. And he kissed her with great joy. Sir, she said, pulling away for a moment, there is more you must know. Several years ago, I was deformed by an enchantment caused by my brother, the terrible Black Knight. He put this spell on me because I would not give him my treasure and my land. And because of this curse, my beauty, as you see it now, will not hold. You need to choose whether you will have me fair by night and foul by day, or else have me fair by day and foul by night. With the enchantment, it cannot be both. What do you choose? Alas, said Guan, the choice is hard. To have you fair by night and no more, that would grieve my heart right sore. And if I desire by days to have you fair, then nights I'm sure I could not bear. 
So I must put the choice in your own hands. Whatever you choose, well then, as your husband, that choice will also be my own, and I will be glad of it. Oh, most honorable and compassionate of all knights, cried Lady Ragnall. Now the enchantment is released completely. You shall have me fair both day and night. For the only thing that could release me from this evil curse was the granting to me by my husband and of his own free will the sovereignty which is mine by nature. And now, courteous Gowan, you have done just that. You have granted me sovereignty, that which every woman wants above all. Kiss me and be glad. And so it was that Lady Ragnall remained beautiful all day and all night and she and Gowan lived happily ever after. This version of the story of Lady Ragnall does not paint woman as loathsome of her own accord. A man, the Black Knight, made her seem that way. This is what we have dealt with for so very long. Masculine energy trying to victimize us by taking whatever looks like our power in order to get us under control. What it misses is that our real power is our sovereignty, our right to make our own choices without outside interference, which we have no desire to use to harm others. And even when that is taken, it can be reclaimed when we find the balance of feminine and masculine energy. In the kitchen, making soup. The fragrance of sage whispers to me about long-forgotten memories that even in this moment I cannot fully recall. I just know they are there. I can feel them in the scent. When my senses no longer detect it as strongly, I am caught between the initial desire upon smelling that warm aroma to open up and let it all pour out of me. And the desire to start all over again and repeat that first moment when the sweetness of the herb first tickled my nose. Like a first kiss that can never happen again. Looking into your eyes, feeling the electricity between us, feeling the warmth of your body as you draw closer tracing the outline of your lips with my eyes, smelling the taste of your breath, closing my eyes to savor each step and submit to the overwhelming yearning. I am lost within you. I am lost without you. I want to steal those moments from the past and make them happen all over again. Aching to be where I belong, yet knowing that land no longer exists. It has split apart and become two. Desperate islands floating at sea. How did we ever get so far apart? Yet I can't quite remember when we were not. I hear you scream my name, but I cannot answer, for if I do, the cycle will repeat. I will fall deep. You will fall far. I have spent my entire life searching for you while you have spent your entire life running from me. 
Amazing what fear and bravery can do. Me, afraid of losing you. You, brave, not finding me. Me, brave, searching for you. You, afraid and hiding from me. I think of this at the end of each day and wake with it first thing on my mind. Which of us is right? But this morning, I awoke with a sword in my hand, the other one stained in blood. The demon I slew, a foggy memory. Lush green landscape spattered with red, impaled remembrances brought to the pyre to burn away. Libertarian dreams that only warriors make true. My battle has been won. I can dance in the sun and wash my life anew. From afar, I smell the burning of sage and hear the singing of victory songs. I am called to dance in a circle of white light, and for this my heart does long. To drink the blood of fear and celebrate into the night. To know pure love is near, and for this there is no fight. I have returned to the magic of the land of my heart, where all is fair and gay. And this I and promise this my, I promise dear, my true dear true with home, you, with you, I will you, always, with you, stay. always stay. Woman, what will you do when inevitably your choices and boundaries are challenged? We have already talked about some ways to make choices and set boundaries in life. But what do we do when the toxic aspect of masculine energy surfaces and tries to bully us out of the choices we have made and the boundaries we have set? Well, first of all, we must know ourselves. We must know what it feels like to be in our very own energy without the influence of others' energy. We must know sovereignty. That takes spending some time alone and becoming deeply familiar with how our own energy feels. Many people are afraid of being alone, even for short periods of time, because they don't want to confront their feelings about themselves. They become anxious or say that they are bored when they're alone. They look for things to do to distract their minds, or they numb themselves so they won't feel. It is important for women to spend some time alone to begin to know who she really is. We all know women who always seem to be in some romantic relationship or another. One relationship ends, poorly of course, and before the dust settles, she is in another relationship. She has not given herself time to heal. She has not given herself time to integrate the lessons she should have learned from the first relationship. Instead, she has given into the anxiety of her mind or that society has placed upon her. If she had only given herself time to be in her own energy, to understand who she is, she could break the cycle of negative patterns in her life. Know yourself. Know the difference between your own energy and someone else's. And feel the magic of your own essence and power. 
Another way to protect our choices and boundaries is to make another choice and set boundaries. The choice not to participate. If you have spent a significant time around me, you have heard me say, I choose not to participate in that, or I don't participate in that. I exercise that prerogative regularly. I am particular about how I spend my time and energy. I am discerning about who I spend my time and energy with. I just remembered once when I was in the Netherlands in Amsterdam, I found a card that said, life is too short to spend it with assholes. I don't spend time in places or do activities that are detrimental to my life's purpose or are not life affirming. I do not like to be around people who are unkind, rude, highly egotistical, grossly ignorant, or hateful. So I limit my exposure to them. They are exhausting because they suck up so much energy around them and excrete so much dark energy that they make me feel sick. That sounds reasonable or like common sense not to spend time around people like that. But I see so many women allowing themselves to bathe in other people's negative energy, then wonder why they feel depleted or sad. You feel that way because you have not made a decision to affirm your existence. You have allowed yourself to be victimized by someone else. I know exactly what that is like because I have done it myself, which is why I am now careful. Woman, turn your back and walk away. Make the choice not to participate. Don't let other people pull you down. When you see signs or red flags in someone's personality that tells you something is not right, as I often say, you do not have to accept the invitation to their crazy party, nor do you have to buy a ticket for their crazy train. You are not being mean for not participating. You are preserving your own sanity and making healthy decisions for yourself. Now, undoubtedly, there are extreme cases like mental, emotional, and physical abuse, which are much more complicated. They are not so simple to extricate ourselves from. If you find yourself in an abusive situation, please get help. I know it is so very hard, but there are so many resources to help women in these situations. You do not ever deserve to be harmed in any way. You are a precious spirit soul with the human body like every other human being. Please try not to be afraid and help yourself get free from any torture that you are going through. And of course you know me by now. So I am going to recommend Energetic Aids for our challenging people problems. I know many people do not believe in the power of crystals, and that's okay. That is your choice. I am not here to convince you. I don't have time for that. I am just rocking my own path and sharing it. 
For those of you who are interested in the magic of crystals, there is an elegant solution to the issue of negative energy. Black tourmaline, one of my very best friends. She is all around my home and she goes everywhere with me. Black tourmaline is the perfect crystal for protection. She clears the auric field of disharmony. She also provides purification, which helps one rid themselves of negative thoughts. She renders attachments useless and obsessive behaviors impotent. If you are at all sensitive to energy, you will feel black tourmaline immediately. Golden, green, red, pink, blue, all the shades of tourmaline are powerful, but black tourmaline is a special treat. What I have offered here are just some ways to find the courage to be true to your genuine self and walk your path. Remember, it takes practice to change habits. Always remember to respect yourself. It is the best way to teach others to respect you. We have reached the boundaries of today's show, so I'm choosing to end it now. Thank you so much for joining me. I hope you found something in this episode that you can use to help strengthen yourself and keep you on your path. In the show notes, I will also include a link to resources for intimate partner abuse. Again, if you are dealing with emotional, mental, and or physical abuse, please get help. Have a beautiful week, and let's all get together next week and see what interesting things we can talk about. Bye-bye. Thank you so much for listening to this show. I hope you found something useful. Like everything in life, we can take what we need and leave the rest. Please feel free to contact me with comments or questions at womanonherpath at gmail.com.